Hey everybody, today in the shop, I've got a project I'm very excited to undertake, and that is to replace my current solar panel array on top of my van with these carbon fiber panels uh, from Lightleaf Solar. Uh, this product, when I first found out about it about a year ago, I was like immediately intrigued by. Just a few weeks ago, I finally like pulled the trigger and bought a set for my own van, and it just kind of feels like the future of solar panels. So I'm very excited to work with these. I haven't seen any specific write-ups for camper vans, but they are used in like the marine um, and like the teardrop trailer industry quite extensively. So yeah, I'm just very excited to finally get to play around with these. Now, full disclosure, uh, when I originally reached out to Lightleaf with some questions about how exactly I was gonna mount these on my roof, they did agree to give me a small discount basically to like make a video about my thoughts on these. And today I'm gonna try to just give my honest assessment, but you know, that is the reality of any like installation or like unboxing video. Like the true test is gonna be like years down the road. Like did they hold up and did they function well? And today I can't give any info on that, but I am gonna cover why I think they will hold up. So it was worth to me to pay for these. So I think the easiest way for me to convey what made me so excited, like intrigued and like willing to splurge on these light leaf solar panels is to kind of compare them to the two more common options out there, which are like rigid traditional solar panels and then those like thin flexible panels you can get. Uh, rigid panels, probably the most common option out there. Uh, their weight, depending on what size you get, what brand you get is about 10 to 15 pounds for hundred Watts. And you can pay for these anywhere from like uh, less than a dollar a watt for some like offshore no-name trash all the way up to about five dollars a watt if you get like a nice american made panel here now some people may challenge me on this but i think regardless of where you pay in this spectrum they basically work the same once they're on your roof sure like the more expensive ones might have some a nice black anodized frame around it or anything something but they basically work the same you know vans nowadays Unfortunately, they're only gonna last, honestly, like 10 years. Like, I'm not sure. That's just my feeling on the automotive industry these days is vehicles just don't last as long as they used to. So regardless of what you pay here, I think you're gonna get about the same functioning product. And then in terms of durability, I think these rigid panels are definitely a yes. These things just last. Unless you like hit them on a tree branch or something as you're driving by or like snag your wiring, these things just work. This technology has been figured out. If we compare that to flexible panels, you know, if this array seems heavy to you, you may be tempted to go with flexible panels, depending on which one you buy here. They're about four to six pounds per hundred watts. So if you have like a 500, 600 or like bigger array, this weight saving really starts to add up. In terms of price, just like the rigid panels, they're right about the same, you know, price range. If you get the more expensive, like $5 version, um, then you're probably going to get something marketed like directly for the marine industry. That on paper says it's a better product. But in my opinion, in terms of durability, this is a no. I have tried several versions of flexible panels and all of them have delaminated. I think that might have something to do with like where I live and like some of the customers I've installed these for. We're in Western Colorado, like high desert. So quite intense sunshine during the summer, large temperature swings, you know, like over 100 during the day, down to the 50s at night. So I think all of that kind of thermal expansion, that sunlight, these just don't hold up. Every time I've installed these in like less than two years, they've delaminated. And then I gotta go through and like replace them for the customer or like swap them out for rigid panels. So I'm just like kind of tired of this like flexible panel experiment. Somewhere down the line, someone will probably create another version of this and maybe I'll, you know, bite the bullet again and try them out. But at this point, I just don't experiment with these anymore. So let's contrast that to Lightleaf. These 140 watt panels that showed up in the shop, they weigh just over seven pounds each. So if we scale that out to like hundred watts, these are basically right on the money at five watts per hundred watts, five pounds per hundred watts. So we're basically right at the same price uh, weight point as these flexible panels. On the price though, you are paying a premium. Uh, you can find these on a little bit of a sale once in a while, but you're looking at about five to six dollars uh, per watt for the light leaf panels. But as I alluded, regardless of where you pay here, I think they're all gonna fail. And regardless of where you pay here, you're getting a product that basically works identically the same once it's up on your roof. So you are paying a premium for these light leaf panels, but I think it's like significantly better and like significantly different product. That said, in terms of durability, as I alluded to at the start of the video, this is a honest question mark for me. Like I can't see the future, I can't guarantee, but all that like research I did before this, which is like, where they've been used and like what customers have said about it. I think these are gonna work. I think by the way they're basically mounted and the way they're constructed, 
We're not going to have any of that like thermal expansion issues that I think cause flexible panels to delaminate and fail. So I think these are going to work. I'm optimistic. I was willing to spend the money because I think they will work and they have like a tremendous weight savings. So now just like a quick side discussion on efficiency. The reason I put this in quotes is I think when you read about solar panel efficiency on the internet, most of that debate doesn't really apply to camper vans or like the mobile market in general. Um, you know, if you were going to set up an array for your like actual house or like a big array in a field where you've got numerous panels, saving an extra inch per panel because, you know, your solar cells are like at percent more efficient, you know, maybe you can squeeze an extra panel in for a little output. But I honestly think like four camper vans, you know, you're going to have your roof. It's going to have a fixed size. You're probably going to need a ceiling fan. You may choose to run some like big honky rooftop air conditioner. And then you've just got a limited amount of space left. And so you're probably going to be able to like squeeze two panels in here. Maybe if you really need a lot of solar, you'll find a couple more around the ceiling fan. Um, but that's going to be it. So it's like if one of these panels is slightly smaller size, honestly, it usually doesn't matter. What was probably more likely to matter is just like the available dimensions. So sometimes, you know, I've actually purchased polycrystalline panels, which are usually, you know, viewed as being less efficient, but they were just available in like some kind of weird size, which made it so like maybe instead of two panels here, I could install like four panels across it just because of the available dimensions. So I think that like on paper marketing efficiency doesn't apply to camper vans. Things that I do think kind of plague the efficiency of these two, first off, flexible panels, ventilation, they get hotter because you have to glue them down to the substrate. And I think if you like look at the like thermal response of solar cells to heat, if your panels are pushing like 200 degrees Fahrenheit in the summer, you could be losing like 15, 20% of your output just because they're so hot. So ventilation, I think is something that plagues these uh, flexible panels. So light leaf panels, I think that will be less of an issue or will be as much of an issue as standard rigid panels. Cause since we are mounting them on little feet, they are going to develop, like maintain an air gap underneath. So these will stay slightly cooler. And then what I think plagues rigid panels is uh, something I like to maybe I'll call the uh, edge effect. If you mount your rigid panels on your roof um, in what I would say is the most common way, which is either like between the roof rails or if you've gone with like a big honky roof rack, they're probably going to be perfectly like horizontal. And then I find that that little aluminum frame around the edges, unless you have like a really significant precipitation event, it just like collects dust and dirt. So as you see, like in this footage I have of my panels from the summer, you can clearly see that these have been wetted by the rain as the rain comes through, but there's just never enough of like a strong flow over that lip to actually get the dirt out of there. So that dirt just stays up there and dirty panels are less efficient. So light leaf solar with that curved design, I think even small little piece of events will like help these just get rinsed off and stay a lot cleaner, which I hope boosts the efficiency. So I think the design of this, um, you know, we'll just write design good. <laughs> Anyways, you know, that's to me the 40 pounds or so that I think I'm going to save off my roof with these uh, light leaf solar panels is tremendous. You know, like weight up high in the van is the worst place you can have it. I think getting that weight off the roof is super beneficial. So to me, it was worth splurging on these panels. I think they're just uh, like, yeah, it feels like a, like the solar panels of the future. It's probably like the first people that started using lithium batteries in their van, you know, you kind of you're just excited to work with like what seems like actually a better product instead of just like paying a premium for a product that's marketed as being better, but probably functions exactly the same. So I'm super excited to work with this product and yeah, let's get going on that kind of install right now. So I've got a few quick things to mention up front here while I play this footage of me removing the old panels. First, as I'll soon be showing, I'm using VHB tape to mount some aluminum brackets to the roof that I'll then bolt the panels to. This is a fairly common practice in vans and I've never had any issues with it, but I do think you need to be pretty careful when doing the installation. Make sure you've purchased like name brand genuine VHB tape and then make sure everything is as clean as possible to make sure you have good adhesion. Even the aluminum extrusion I've purchased, I specifically chose it so that I have plenty of surface area to make sure that I got like plenty of strength out of that VHB tape. Second, these solar panels don't come with MC4 connectors and I'm actually really happy about that. I think the practice of having MC4 connectors on the end of your solar panel leads is kind of an artifact of using like domestic panels on houses and in like a van install, I think it just usually looks kind of bulky and kind of ugly when you have like four panels and all these connectors up that you're trying to splice together. 
These panels come with a single two conductor cable coming out of each panel, and that will allow me to basically splice everything together in a small terminal box, and I think it just looks way cleaner. And lastly, make sure you pay attention to the voltage and the amperage output of these panels. The panels I'm using here, the 140 watt model, they have an output of 25 volts, which is higher than your like standard 100 watt panels that output you know 18 to 20 volts usually. In my application, I'm retrofitting this into my system where I have a Victron 100 slash 50 charge controller, meaning it has a maximum voltage input of 100 volts. So if I had wired all four of these panels in series, I would be right at that 100 volt limit. And that's just like a little closer than I like to play. So basically I'm gonna wire this as two parallel sets of two panels in series. Basically I'm just saying pay attention to the specs. All right, so once I had the old panels off, I just laid the new panels on the roof just to see how everything would fit. I knew these would dimensionally fit because I didn't just buy them blindly, but it is always nice to just lay things out and see how everything is gonna to work together. And with the new solar panels up on the roof, I could make some measurements and figure out what angle the new brackets are gonna to have to be. So these are gonna need a little bit of an angle. So if we zero this, so then this leg, about a 10 degree up, and then if we come over to the other side, um, okay, so based on the, some of the readings here, we're getting about uh, 10 degrees on this side, about 12 degrees on that side. Uh, so I think we're shooting for about 11 degrees. I basically got to bend my little aluminum bracket slightly. I think that will fit quite nicely and then you know the roof's got a little bit of give to it panel has a tiny bit of give the aluminum brackets are 16th inch so i think uh if we're off by a degree i think we'll even out all right so let's quickly talk about these brackets i plan to make i purchased this uh, aluminum c channel this is about an inch this well this is an inch and a half this is an inch and the current plan is to essentially cut off about uh, half of this leg so that when it's mounted in the panel it can essentially rest on this flat portion. And here I'm gonna end up uh, putting a couple of rib nuts in each one and then we'll have bolts from the other side coming through. So that is uh, basically, I gotta make 16 of those brackets. I'll probably do um, four, four inch long brackets per panel. So 16 brackets to be made, all right. So to batch out all 16 of these brackets consistently, I'm gonna make a few little jigs along the way to just make the process nice and repeatable. To cut the aluminum, I'm gonna be using the miter saw. I really enjoy having some kind of wooden support to the aluminum I'm cutting when I'm doing this. I mean, it is a fairly safe process, but I just find that whatever weird mishap of like an edge getting caught, uh, like the effects of that is just much less violent if you've got a piece of wood basically supporting the aluminum. My two cents here. So to get a consistent length, or at least as consistent as I need for this application, I mean, it's not like precision science here. It just needs to be roughly five inches. I'll actually use just a little pencil line that I make on the miter saw so I can repeatedly basically measure my cut. And then I've just used a scrap piece of wood that I've essentially uh, cut a couple grooves into that will kind of help me hold the aluminum against the fence. After that, I've got to cut about half of one face off. Again, I'll make a little scrap bracket here so I can essentially clamp what I'm cutting down. This way my fingers don't have to be too close to the blade. This would have been a really tricky cut if you didn't make some kind of jig to hold this steady. Since the part to the left of the blade never moves, it basically replicates how much I'm cutting off every single time. And now it's time for the bending. This part turned out a little trickier than I expected. All right, so I tried to cut a couple of jigs. I could essentially put this over here and hammer it over the edge. Um, I'm having some trouble getting that to be consistent. So I've moved on to the more crude method and a little slower, but essentially just taking one of these uh, sheet metal tools. Um, and then I'm just slowly prying it up. And then when the number is essentially between 10 and 12, I call it good. So I tried to be pretty careful through this process. Do not overbend the aluminum. I think, uh, what is it, like aluminum kind of tends to fatigue pretty quickly and becomes quite brittle if you end up uh, trying to essentially bend it back. So you only get to basically bend it once if you want to keep it strong. I think someone uh, more familiar with metalwork would be better at explaining that. And continuing, once all the brackets were bent, I had to drill the holes for the rib nuts. 
instead of having to measure and like mark every single one, I've made this little jig so the brackets uh, can slap in, slide in here and then I can just drill through and get my holes in the same location. All right, onwards, putting all our rib nuts. I like, I've got this uh, rib nut gun. If you do a lot of these, this is a real time saver, sensitive to what pressure you run. And I found with these stainless steel thread, uh, threads, uh, stainless steel rib nuts, you have to be even more uh, diligent about making sure your threads stay lubed. Otherwise you'll strip it out and then it's a pain in the ass to uh, suddenly have your tools stuck in the bracket you're working on. So uh, we're at 55 PSI, and then I just use uh, some cutting fluid to keep my threads lubricated. Oh yeah, one more tip. I like to make sure I pre-thread the fastener onto this stem, or onto this thread here. If you put this in here and then you decide to try to then start, if you do cross-thread this, then we'll get jammed on the thread, and suddenly you've got this thing that's stuck on there, and uh, again, another annoyance. Anyways, usually about every two or three brackets, so every bit like four to six rib nuts with these, I'll uh, drop another little bit more cutting fluid on. All right, all the threads are in, and now I'm just going to take a file, get rid of some of these burrs and sharp points. Uh, then I think we'll add the VHB tape, got to drill the holes in the solar panels, and then we'll test fit. So the VHB tape part is mostly self-explanatory. I use some alcohol to clean the surfaces, um, and then I just kind of lay them out side by side on the tape and use a knife to trim the excess. If you get an air bubble, I'll make a little slit, and then I'll use a roller to essentially squeeze the air out. And finally, onto the stressful part, drilling out these carbon fiber solar panels. A neat thing about these light leaf panels is you can drill anywhere in the outside flange or like perimeter to mount them however you need. So once again, I'll make a little wooden setup block so I can replicate my holes precisely at every corner. Even though I'm quite confident I've got everything measured out correctly, I still make my first set of holes with a tiny little 1 64th inch drill bit. That way if I do figure out I'm slightly off and my brackets don't line up perfectly, I can adjust instead of being stuck with the full size holes. Thankfully my test holes do work out, so I drill out my guide to the full size and then proceed to do the rest of the corners. I should mention that I'm using a brad point drill bit to drill these bigger holes. It's not a very stressful or complicated process to drill carbon fiber, especially thin stuff like this, but I do use a backer piece just to make sure I don't get any blowout. Well, that's pretty damn clean. Happy with that. Bottom looks all right as well. And as I drill the holes, I go ahead and attach the brackets. For the final install, I will be using a lock washer, but this is just a temporary attachment of these brackets as I will have to remove them before the whole installation is complete. So all that's left now is to mount the panels. The way I like to do this is I lay out my panels exactly where I want them, then I'll use some masking tape to essentially mark where I want the little feet to land. On the far side of the panel that I can't reach, I'll use a wood block to kind of let it float. So that way I can precisely set down the two feet closest to me exactly where I want them. And I pull the wood block out and the far side drops into place. At this point, what I think really helps kind of the longevity of this VHB tape setup is to actually pull the panels off so that you can come back around and silicone and just like water seal everything around those feet. So that's what I did now. Dokey, it's been a few hours now. Let's see how our silicone is doing here. Um, yeah, it's not 100% set, but good enough for now. So that's where all the little brackets look like. Now I'm gonna reinstall the panels and then start messing with the wiring. So it's pretty exciting to be finally screwing down the panels, but there's not a whole lot I have to say about it. 
I just secure things down and finally ready to move on to that wiring. One thing I really do appreciate about these panels is the fact that they do have just one two conductor wire coming out of each panel. I think this allows for just a much cleaner wiring job. I've also got to say that I think this is a silicone jacket or like a silicone insulation on this wiring. Uh, don't quote me on that, but it is just like extremely supple, even in like the relatively cold temperatures of the shop. I mean, I think it's about mid forties right now where I'm wiring, but I wish like all tools or like anything would come with these. It is just so much easier to work with wire that is just so supple and so easy to maneuver. So all four wires from these solar panels, I route into this little watertight junction box I found at superbrightleds.com. This box I'm just holding down with another piece of VHB tape. The wire that I've routed into this box, I like to hold it down with these little adhesive back zip tie holders. I think this just helps things stay organized and it prevents anything from like fluttering once you're driving at high speeds. Then I cut off all the excess wire and I just gotta make all the connections in the junction box. An unusual little tip that I find really helpful is if you wanna get the outer jacket off some of these like duplex or two conductor wires, then I use an old seam ripper from my sewing kit. You should try it out. It really works great for this. Otherwise, I think this step is pretty mundane. About the only other thing I'd maybe point out you perhaps haven't seen before are these like crimpable wire nuts. I think for stranded wire, these work a lot better than like the twist style you can get at the big box store. Everything fits in the box nicely. And as I mentioned at the start of this video, I really prefer this look over a bunch of like MC4 connections on top of your roof. Like here's a pan of what the previous wiring looked like. I really tried to kind of zip tie everything firmly, but there's just a lot of big bulky connectors here. And here is what the finished product looks like that I've got here. So that is the finished wiring. Um, fairly low profile, I think. All right, all of this will be cleaned up in a sec. See so yeah, that comes out of there. I had to splice from my old cable into the box where everything is spliced together. And yeah, all right, now it's got to clean up. And that's the end of this install, basically. I've just got some cleaning up and I got to get rid of this plastic wrap. So it's probably a good time to cover how much weight did these panels actually save me. Well, the old panels I removed, they were 70.5 pounds and then all the bolts and then like these screw plates that fit in the roof rack rails, they were another 3.2 pounds for a total of 73.7 pounds removed. These new panels with the brackets were 33.48 pounds. The little junction box was 0.32 pounds. But from that, we actually remove a couple things. All the excess wire I cut off took away 1.58 pounds. And even like this protective plastic wrap that I'm pulling off, that was another 0.28 pounds. So I added to the roof basically 32 pounds. There are some tiny, tiny things I didn't include here. Like I cut off some of the wiring from the old setup. I added a little bit of new wiring and connectors. So the total amount I saved off the roof of my van is somewhere between 41 and a half and 42 pounds. And that's just fantastic. I think there's one thing to just like read all the marketing language. And it's another thing to like actually see that in practice, see that come together and like actually be able to attain those weight savings. All right, well, that's a wrap on the install. That honestly went a lot smoother than I expected. Um, you know, I think that curved panel look is probably a little unusual, but honestly, to me, it's like, this is, I think, the best lightweight panel option out there. Uh, so I was really excited to work with these, and it was, just, it was just a fun install. Everything went smoothly, so that's nice when that happens. Uh, I want to say thanks to Lightleaf again. They answered quite a few of my questions before I actually purchased these, just to make sure that they'd work and then you know thanks to them again for giving me a little bit of a price break uh yeah it's just a product i'm really excited about you know i love kind of tinkering with lightweight build lightweight design lightweight products and uh this one checks all those categories so anyways hope you found that interesting you know it feels like a product from the future so it was fun for me to play with thanks guys